My name is Michael Goldberg, and I'm our executive director of the Beale Institute for Entrepreneurship here um, at Case Western Reserve University. I'm also a professor at Weatherhead sitting in my office. Um, we are teaching on campus this semester, at least uh, uh, I have some students coming in, a few are remote, but it's, it's great as we get things a little bit more back to normal on campus and, and have folks together. And um, the Zoom format and platform is certainly a way to gather folks, both students and alums and folks from the community. Um, and Marcus, we're thrilled that you're taking the time to be with us today as part of our um, entrepreneurship speaker series. Um, all of our, our, our uh, speaker series events are moderated by students and we're thrilled that Dominique is willing to be our student moderator. We were chatting before from Cote d'Ivoire. We're thrilled to have her on campus and in the US. We love our African students. We love all of our students, but I have a soft spot having lived in South Africa. We were just chatting about South Africa. Marcus, Dominique, and I have all spent time in South Africa, so we were chatting beforehand. So we're, we're so thrilled, Dominique, to have you on campus and moderating the session. For those, and many of you have been in our sessions before, we'd love to have these interactives. So um, please let Dominique know either in the Zoom chat or if you're watching on LinkedIn Live, just post a question in the comments and Doug and I will be monitoring it because we want it to be as conversational as possible. So with that, Marcus, thanks for joining and Dominique, over to you. Thank you very much, Michael. Hi, everyone. I hope you're all doing great. I am. So I am Anjou Minikiao from Ivory Coast, like you said, and I'm a chemical engineering sophomore at Case Western Reserve University. And today I'm very excited to co-facilitate this speaker series event with uh, Mr. Marcus Martin. So Marcus Martin is from Ohio. He graduated from Morehouse College with a Bachelor of Arts in Business Administration. And he's currently the co-founder and man managing partner at the Inkwell Group. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Mr. Marcus to you. So if you could please give us a brief introduction of who you are, your background, and what made you go into investing, that would be really great. So with that, over to you, Mr. Marcus. Absolutely. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you, Dominique. So again, my name is Marcus Martin. Uh, as Dominique covered, uh, I went to school in the South, but I am a Midwestern uh, boy at heart. I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, uh, went to uh, Morehouse College where I concentrated in finance. Uh, and so all my life, I have really been interested in finance. Uh, even as a kid, you know, I was chose to be treasurer uh, in, in all the different entities and, and groups. So it started at a very young um, uh, phase of my life. And I would I save every tech for my job and I put it in a box and probably abnormal versus versus some kids. Um, as I got though into college, uh, I didn't know what Wall Street was, that world. Like I grew up in the inner city Columbus. Um, so that just that just wasn't something um, that we were, you know, we saw or our family members were doing. Uh, but when I got to Morehouse, it was the first thing they hit me with. They said, look, if you're going to be a top finance student here at Morehouse, you, you got to do a summer on Wall Street. Uh, and then you should probably do consulting. I didn't know what either one was. And so I said, OK, fine, I'll give it a shot. And so my sophomore year, in between my sophomore and junior year, I interned at Credit Suisse First Boston in New York, going through their rotational program. And it was an amazing experience. I, I spent time doing investment banking. I spent time on the sales and trading floor, and then I spent time um, on their and one of their debt teams with real estate finance securitization, which basically means those are the guys that take all the commercial real estate loans and they package them together and then they sell them out to to investors. Uh, so that was great. The next summer, though, I wanted to get a different experience, and so I interned at McKinsey and Company in their Atlanta office to try and do. Uh, to, to help companies from a consulting perspective. When it all came down to it, I, at the time, I felt as if the Wall Street uh, path was a little narrow and I wanted to be more broad. And so I joined McKinsey right after school. And I did that for a couple of years, but my life actually changed while I was at McKinsey. I had my first daughter uh, with my wife, so we started pretty early. Uh, not too many 23-year-olds these days are... Uh, are starting families, but we started a family 
And so I knew that I wanted to get off the road. I was traveling all the time uh, at, at McKinsey. And I also wanted to be closer to the impact, if you will. When you're a consultant, you give recommendations on how to improve a business. But then you leave it to the business itself to really implement, execute more often than not. And so I wanted to have more direct value. And so that is when I got introduced to private equity in a meaningful way. And I didn't know anything at the time. I had to do a lot of study and I had to figure out what's venture capital, what's growth equity, what's leverage buyouts, what are all these different terms that are in the private equity industry. Uh, and, and ultimately I got a job at uh, HIG Ventures as we were transitioning to growth equity. And growth equity, all that means is we're taking companies that have a track record and have performed and we're investing in them to help accelerate that growth, but we're not taking control of those companies. Um, whereas in venture investing, you're typically, those companies don't have much of a track record, if any at all, and you're kind of investing in an idea. And then what I do now is actually later stage private equity, which we take companies that maybe aren't as rapidly growing, but they have long histories of performance and consistency. And we do actually take control of, the, uh, of those companies, but keep the management teams in place or make improvements. So um, I started at HIG and then I moved to Cleveland in 2008 with my family. And I joined the Riverside company here in town. Riverside is one of the world's most well-known private equity firms. They're very, very active. Um, Stuart Cole and, and Bela, who are the co-CEOs, they've done a phenomenal job growing that entity. And it's a great place to train and learn. Uh, and there I was focused on doing buyout deals, so those controlled deals, of smaller companies, less than $5 million in profit. Um, and they could probably get up to $50 million in revenue, which in the world that we live in, that's a relatively small um, company. Uh, did that for several years and really like building the connections with the owners, the founders. Like that's one of the things that's exciting about investing is you, you get to, you, you get to interact with those folks who have really said, you know what, I want to put my own blood, sweat and tears into growing something and, and really do it and hearing their stories and helping them by providing them capital and providing them resources to, to further their own stories. Um, was really impactful. Having those interactions led me to want to be an entrepreneur myself. And so my business partner and I, we met in 2009 and became friends, started talking about it and said, you know what? We write these big checks to these, you know, these founders. And I want to be the person who's getting the big check. I don't want to write the big check. I want to, I want to, I want to get the big check. And so we started laying the groundwork for starting our own firm, our own company. But before we did that, we thought it was really important to actually operate a company. So up until that point, all I've done is invest in companies or advise them. I never actually run them. And so I left Riverside, joined KeyBank and on their community bank side, and I grew to run their small business product strategy team. And... Essentially, all that means is I was trying to figure out from a banking perspective, how can we help small businesses grow? So the common theme you'll hear here with my career is that it is how can I add value to small or medium sized companies so that they can do better? Like that is that is what gets me excited. That's what I wake up and want to do every single day. Did that for a, a little bit. And then we launched the Inkwell Group. And this is where the diversity element comes into play. We felt that private equity should have a place in kind of solving some of the world's issues. The, uh, diversity and representation is one of those. So for us, we took a private equity strategy and said, you know what? We're going to diversify the management teams and the boards of the companies that we invest in as an additional value creation lever because there's plenty of data out there that supports that when a company has a diverse leadership team or they have a diverse board, they tend to perform better 
from a profitability metric, from an employee satisfaction metric, all of the kind of key metrics that matter, then they're industry peers. And you can make assumptions on why you think that is. I quite honestly believe that it's because if you're diverse, that means you're open-minded and that your people can bring their best, most authentic selves to the place of employment. And when, you, when, you're, when your people are bringing their best selves, then you're getting the best performance for your company. Uh, so that, that was our strategy. And that's what we've been building upon uh, for the last three or four years now, um, as we look to kind of continue to make more and more investments. And it's, it's led us to a place now where we actually have an opportunity. Uh, we're out raising um, uh, a, a fund uh, to do this on a larger scale. Than, than what we've previously done. So that's a little bit of a long background. So let me pause because I, I know we want to get to additional questions. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, I think right now we can take one question from the audience. Does anyone um, want to ask a question? So you can either raise your hand in the, via the Zoom icon or type it in the chat. Hey, Marcus, I'll ask something. This is Peter Johnson. Uh, what are some of the things with the companies that you invest in, what are some of the things you're doing to help potentially have to convince them this is the right thing to do? No, that, that's a great question, Peter. Uh, so I, I will say most times when we're coming in to invest in a company, it's because they've kind of raised their hand in some capacity to say, they believe they need capital, right? To do whatever it is that's going to help them achieve their next goal. Sometimes that's, I've tied all my wealth into this company and I need to uh, uh, get more liquid in, in some cases or diversify my own personal assets. So bringing in an outside investor can help you accomplish that. Most of the time though, it's because they feel like they've kind of hit a ceiling on where they can take the company and they need help figuring out how do I get it to the next level? So oftentimes what that means from our perspective is uh, we look at both inorganic strategies. And so when I say inorganic, I mean, can we help them go to add on acquisitions to help them grow, whether that's a new product set that they want to go after that maybe a competitor or another company does really well. Um, is it buying a, a, a similar size uh, or a similar style of company, but now gives them a larger footprint or something like that. That's a lot of what we do. The other side is on the organic side. So this is where we're looking internally at the company and saying, okay, how effective is our sales strategy? Can, can, you know, do we need to hire more people? Do we have to have a different program? Oftentimes at the size of the companies that we're looking at investing in, their systems tend to be very remedial. So they might still be using Excel or pen and paper, or you know, some of them have QuickBooks, but you know, they don't have some of the more advanced systems that will allow you to scale um, at a at, you know at a faster clip. And, and like, we don't fault the, the the management teams for not having these things. They're so busy just trying to get product out the door or run their business that they're not thinking about some of these other things. So we can really come in from a strategic standpoint and say, okay. Here are some of the best in class ways to sell sports effectiveness or different marketing or different pricing strategies, et cetera. And then we've also got relationships with third parties who specialize in those areas that we can then bring to the table. Uh, that becomes a, a definitely a source of value. And then the last thing I would say is we'll all, we'll take over kind of the dealing with the banks and all the different financing uh, elements that quite honestly, CEOs don't want to deal with. Like they don't want to be talking to the banks. They want to be running their business. So, so we'll, we'll do those things. And, and then I, sometimes it also means we have to augment the team. Right. Well, and I, I guess my thought was more of, I think those are grow things that most businesses like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I need this. The thing I'm, there seems to be companies that like, as far as the diversity inclusion and doing some of these more social, they're like that for, so often gets put in, that's a touchy feely. Yeah, I've got, to, I've got all this other stuff I've got to focus on. Why should I bother doing that? You know, is that consume yeah, time so, versus, because I agree with you, there's tons of research out there to show. That's why we're all here is, you know what? I, I think that's one of the biggest things to help 
convince people? Yeah. So Peter, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and sorry, I didn't touch on it. So, so I want to also be very clear. We believe that diversity and inclusion super difficult to accomplish if a company is already past a certain point in size, scale, history, et cetera, because you're, you're trying to change the culture of a, of a company. And I think that quite honestly, that is really difficult to do and not make it feel like it's just an initiative or it's, it's, it's a part-time project. I think that the work is very, very important. We just think that it's also very difficult. So the approach that we take is we're going after these smaller companies that haven't haven't told their complete story yet. And they oftentimes have gaps in their teams that we're going to make a very concerted effort to, to, to bring in a diverse candidate to fill those gaps. So whether that's a missing CFO or you know they don't have somebody who can be their head of sales or things like that. But we think it's important to bring it in at the leadership level because uh, the data would support that people hire off of recommendations. Recommendations come from your circle. Most people's circles tend to look similar to themselves, whether that is we play football together or, you know, we go to the same country club or, you know, but it's also very racial in a lot of ways, right? I mean, it's, if you, if you, if each of you were to look at who are your five closest friends, I would venture to say that more often than not, they tend to, uh, from a race perspective, they tend to look like us or from a sexual orientation, there might be similarities there. Like, it's just natural. I don't, I don't fault anybody for that. It's just natural. So it stands to, it stands to reason then that if we diversify our leadership teams, we increase the probability that they're going to then hire more diverse uh, managers or you know, line people who they can then develop and help elevate and grow. So that is a, that is a core part of what we do versus saying, hey, we're going to go hire a, D, a DEI uh, person and that person doesn't have any P&L responsibility. They're just out there trying to make sure that the company is following these, these protocols, which again, I just think that can be very difficult because when the rubber meets the road, the, share, the, the, the executives of these large companies are, are held responsible to deliver returns to the shareholders. And that oftentimes becomes a earnings per share. And that is hard, to your point, sometimes to draw the correlation between, hey, we're more diverse entity, therefore our EPS is, is higher. It's just, it, the, to make that connection to somebody who doesn't inherently believe that, um, uh, that they're not necessarily hiring the best, right? Because everybody says, look, I'll hire anybody, but I, you know, I hire the best who comes to me kind of thing. That's, that's the out, that's the escape route. And we just don't buy that, right? Like we don't, we don't believe that you're actually doing that because if you are indeed hiring the best, then it should stand to be that your team should look very different um, in, in most cases. Does that help? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Peter, for your questions. Um, we can still take a few, so feel free to just raise your hand or like type it in the chat. And remember to also unmute yourself and just read out your question if you would like, you would like to. Hi, Marcus. Um, first, I just want to say I love your, your company name. I live on Martha's Vineyard. Um, <laughs> You may have mentioned this, but do you invest in startups or are you only investing in companies that are a little bit more established? So we, we do not invest in startups. We, we target the, the more established companies. But the great thing about we're talking about diversity and investing and why it's important, there has been a almost like a watershed moment uh, that's going on. Um, I, I think some of it will come out of all the social injustice that kind of happened. Because as we begin to really grow again, and there's a lot of options that we will. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think some of it's due to some of the social injustice that's happened in our country, unfortunately, that's really opened up the eyes to many um, investors or LP investors. But diversity is becoming more and more important. 
and impact investing is becoming more and more important. And so we're seeing a rise in the number of firms that are investing in startups uh, and, and particularly targeting um, diverse, uh, diverse entrepreneurs and things like that. So um, while we don't do that ourselves, we think we're trying to fill a different void uh, that, that exists. We are very well connected to many of the groups that are out there. So I don't know if your question was going this way, Leslie, but if you, if you happen to have um, companies or you're an entrepreneur yourself and you're, you're, you know, you're looking for that, yeah, we, certainly have some, we, we certainly have some people that we could you know, potentially introduce you to. Okay, so I'll follow up with you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you I think very Jaylen's much. got her hand up here. Oh, sorry. Um, it looks like Jaylen Glasgow has a question. Would you like to unmute, unmute yourself and introduce yourself as well? Yes, thank you. So I'm Jaylen. I'm a master's of accounting student. It's my last semester here. Congratulations. At thank you. And um, I don't know. I just feel like I've I'll, I'll give you one question. So for example, I'll be working at Deloitte in accounting um, this summer and the Cleveland office is, I'm like one of two people of color in the office. And I guess my question is, I know you deal with small, um, smaller companies, but how do you, I guess, how do you fit, how do you convince a larger corporation to, um, I guess, value diversity because mm -hmm. it's unfortunate like for myself I've never worked somewhere where I've been like the only person of color and it's an international company and like how do you I mean you can't convince everyone but how do you make that a priority in your office yeah so first of all congratulations on the job I think Thank that's you. that's awesome uh and Deloitte is a wonderful firm I've done a lot of work with Deloitte um over, over my years. When you're in this world, first and foremost, you are, for now, you're going to have to get used to being one of, or two of, you know, a type of thing. That's, that is just the reality of the situation. But that being said, um, I, I find that companies like that, they're, they're supportive. They want to be supportive. Sometimes it takes somebody raising their hand and saying this is what you can do to show more of that support so it, very tactically Jalen, what i would do when i when i get there is first of all i would find the other people who are trying to champion that cause because i i guarantee you in, a, in an entity the size of deloitte there are others who this issue matters to so connect with them right. you know, build build a support system with those individuals find the other people who are kind of the friends of diversity, right? They, they, you know, because I'm a white male, a straight white male, doesn't mean I don't appreciate diversity, right? So right. You, there will be people there who are going to be supportive. Find those people, reach out to them, better understand what the, the, the company is doing. And then at the local level, I think this is where you will have the opportunity to be proactive and say, okay, I think this is an issue here in Cleveland specifically. These are my ideas on how I think we can we can remedy some of those, and I'm willing to spearhead those things. That will show a, a, a level of initiative that I think any company would welcome from their employee base. Of course, you need to make sure that you're doing well in your job as well. Right. I mean, so right. like, let's, let's not lose sight of the fact that, you know, these things are important issues, getting diversity, but you also have to perform. Right. And if you're performing well, it will make getting the other part that much easier to get other people to kind of rally around as well. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, no problem. Thank you, Jaylene. Okay, um, there is Arlette, right? Also, um, Rosa Hand. So, would you like to unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and ask your question? Or you can also just type it in the chat. Thank you. I just wanted to ask I, I love the advice that you gave, but at what point 
does it not become your job as a person of diverse background? And, and how much time do you give that before you decide, you know what, it's time for me to leave this company? Yeah, Ar Arlette, that's a, I don't know that there is a specific time frame. What I, what, how I would position my answer there is, you know, you know when you know. And, and I know that that's generic, but the point I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is if you get the sense that it's, it's not as important uh, to your organization as you'd like it to be, then I think it's incumbent upon you to move on and find that place where you're going to be happy. I, I generally believe, this, and it's cliche, but life truly is short and it is unexpected. And we spend way too much time in our work environments to be unhappy in that environment. So for me, that leash might be shorter or that fuse might be shorter than it could be for some someone else. It's all about like, what is the tolerance level? So if you can honestly look at just look in the window and say, like I tried, they, they didn't receive it the way I wanted to receive it. And I don't see the improvements happening in the way I want them to happen. Then I think it's completely fair and okay to walk away. I will say again, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's really, really difficult for the large companies. That nothing happens at large companies quickly. And I would, I, I would say that while there's Diversity Inc. magazine's been you know, labeling the top employers for diversity for, for years on years, I honestly believe that 2020 was the first time that people really started paying attention to diversity in a meaningful way and are trying to figure out how to solve it. So I think it's going to, I, I think it's going to take years for those organizations to, to really get there, but I am optimistic that, that we will get there uh, as, a, as a country and, and as an economy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arlette, for your question. We can take another question if anyone wants to um, ask. You can just ra raise your hand, unmute yourself, introduce yourself and ask the question. Yes, Michael. <laughs> thanks, Dominique. This is a great session. Um, thanks, Marcus, so much for coming in. Thanks, everybody, for all the great questions. Um, I mean, now that you've you've found yourself back in the Midwest and in Cleveland, um, I'd love kind of your perspective on working in finance here, particularly as an entrepreneur. I mean, you've worked at some larger places um, and now um, kind of hanging out your own shingle. Is this, you know, curious sort of, the pros and cons of doing it from Cleveland, and yeah. are you optimistic about um, the support that that entrepreneurs and investors like yourself are receiving in in setting up shop here in Cleveland? Yeah, another really great question. Um, so I'll start the story this way: Joke, who's my partner, he and I met. Because when he moved to Cleveland, he he joined what was Key Principal Partners, is now called Cyprium. He was looking for other minorities in private equity in Cleveland. There were three of us at the time. Um, and so we, we found each other, and, and two of us were at Riverside, right? Uh, and now neither of us are at Riverside, uh, the, the two there. Um, so from that perspective, I think finding people who look like you and make you feel like there is a real example of, of success. And, and I think, unfortunately, looking at it from a race perspective or a gender perspective can sometimes be oversimplifying it, but it is nonetheless um, a reality that when you don't see any others in the room that look like you, it does make you feel like the odds are stacked up against you a little bit more. Um, so Cleveland 
is not one of the areas in the country where there are a lot of people of, of color uh, or uh, many females, quite honestly, uh, that are doing private equity and investing. It's, it's, just, it's just not. So that part is more challenging. Uh, but I will say though, for a mid-major city, Cleveland actually has a lot of representation in the investment space. Um, so if you, if you say New York, Chicago, LA, Boston, you know, maybe the DC area, those are big hubs. And then you want to get to like those second tier. So you compare Cleveland to a uh, Pittsburgh or to a, uh, you know, also, or somebody like that. I actually think Cleveland has, has quite a bit of representation on the later stage investing, not as much on the early stage. Jump starts kind of trying to change that and have an influence there. There is a, you know, there's a Cleveland Innovation Project that's going on right now that I think they're really trying to change things. Cleveland has a lot to offer people, but it takes somebody actually coming to see it and experience it. And, and so what I have found is that people who are outside of the city of Cleveland try, don't really give Cleveland a chance because they're like Cleveland, you know? But when you're here, low cost of living, great school, down to earth people, um, easy to network if you really want to. Um, so I think it has a lot going for it. And I think the people in power, the people with money, people with resources are starting to say, you know what? It's time for Cleveland to reach Columbus's level, reach Pittsburgh's level, do those things. And they're making efforts to drive us in that direction. So I am, I am optimistic uh, about where Cleveland will be. Um, you know, I don't know if it's going to be five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road, but I, I do believe that people are starting to make the move in the right direction. Great. Thank you. These are all some amazing, amazing questions. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to get uh, when, I, when I came here. So hopefully, hopefully I'm doing you all justice, but these are great. Hey, it looks like Rebecca has a question. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask it? Sure. Hi, my name is Rebecca Manning. I'm a dual master's student in the public health and nutrition program. I'm working on a startup around health communication and literacy. Um, so my question is very specific. I've kind of been in some rooms around investment opportunities, and it's interesting to think about the statements you made earlier on angel investing and venture capital investing and how you should almost expect that they're going to want some type of stake or control. Um, and if you're more interested in kind of the, the other source of investments um, and, and your business model and moving that forward, that wouldn't really require that sort of level of control where you can still maintain like your mission and your vision while also um, progressively moving towards the sustainability of your business. Um, what type of rooms like do you need to be in to like have those conversations? And is that more on the individual investing side as well? So I want to first make sure I've, I've, I've got the question down. Is, is the question, I, I want to maintain enough control of my company because there is a large component of it that is mission driven that I, I think that if I lose that control, uh, then I won't be able to drive at the mission aspect of it of, um, by taking on an investor? Is, is, is that, am I heading in the right direction? That's a great point. So the idea is that I work with vulnerable populations. So these are people with low socioeconomic status, people with chronic disease and acute disease states, right? So you can't just have anybody um, coming in. And again, it's it's also part of a wider system. So we would be tying in components from the Medicare system, Medicaid system. And these are a lot of stakeholders that you would need to know, again, who you need to interact with and who should be at the table. So this is kind of like the conversations that that I'm thinking about now and, and moving forward? So what I would say is in the healthcare space, so 
the healthcare space is one that there is a lot of expertise um, in the investor world. Uh, it, it is, it's the market that, and I, it, look, healthcare is broad. You've got diagnostics equipment, you've got services, you've got hospitals, you've got insurance. There's a lot that goes into that. The, the point I would make for you is that you need to find investors who are particularly experienced and focused on the segments that you're trying to serve. And, and believe me, they exist. I mean, I when I was at Riverside, we invested in a company who uh, they delivered incontinence and ostomy products to uh, primarily Medicaid population, right? Uh, and, and so all of, all of their customers uh, tended to fall in the underrepresented, underserved um, community, as an example. Um, so that would be that would be my recommendation for you is you need to make sure that you have an investor who is, is skilled and can bring capital to the table, but more importantly, understands what you're trying to do and can put you in the room with the other stakeholders that are going to help elevate your business to the next level. So who are those different Medicare plans? Who are the Medicaid people? Are there other, other groups and entities that would benefit from uh from the business that you're, you're, you're trying to, to do versus, you know, versus a more generic investor, if you will, because uh, things in healthcare are just very specific that I, I, I'd be leery of somebody who can't point to in, in their history, how they've done something or supported something similar uh, to, to what you're proposing to do. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. I hope um, Marcus' contribution helped you. So we have one last question for the day, and it's from Corey King. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, I'm Corey King. I'm a senior at Case, uh, studying so mechanical engineering. But my question is along the lines of uh, building a pipeline of diversity so we can possibly have um, more people interested in PE. Because I know you mentioned earlier that you said that you were like one of three minorities in Cleveland who is uh, in the PE space. So what are some things that could be done that I could be doing and then everyone else here could be doing to, in, to ensure that there's more people in the pipeline that are minorities? And um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, great, great question, Corey. So there are two elements, I think, right? One is uh, attracting, the other one is retaining. Uh, to, you know, so it, as fast as I bring them in, I got to make sure that I'm slowing down the, the exit pipe, uh, if you will. On the attraction standpoint, um, if, I'm a, if I'm a firm that is committed to getting more diverse candidates in the door, then I have got to change my tactics. I can't continue to do what I've traditionally done. What you find in the world of investing is a lot of cookie cutter templates it's kind of like the IBM model. So I want to go to the same schools that go after the same majors or the same, you know, type of experience. So a typical thing might be they went to Harvard, they then went to an investment bank for two years, and now I'm hiring. And that's great, right? But that's going to get you kind of the same candidates time and time again, right? So if I want to go after a more diverse Base, I need to develop strategies that are going to put me in the places where those individuals are. Right? And, you know, so maybe I'm, ho maybe I'm hosting um, meet and greet events. So, cause I can't go to case and, um, you know, the state and Ohio state and all these schools individually. I don't, maybe I don't have the time to do all that. So, you know what, create centralized things, bring those in. Um, I think I've got to change what I'm looking for, because success is not based off of, did I have the, the same experiences as everybody else? Honestly, success is based off of, what is the character makeup of the individual? Do you, you know, do they work hard? Are they proactive? Um, are they analytical? You know, can, you know, can they figure things out? Like, you're really looking for, for characteristics, not, not experience, but people take the easy way out and just say, well, if you work at these places, that must prove that you can do those things. And the reality is that's, that's not true, right? Um, you could have just interviewed well. Um, so I think 
that's what agencies have to do on on our side. We, you know, you can go to HBCUs because there you can get higher concentrations. But again, everybody doesn't go to an HBCU. So Eric Case Western, not HBCU. So again, find those candidates, reach out for them, and and be open minded to taking on um, people with different backgrounds. Then, from you know, if I'm a student. What can I do? Right, it was part of your question. If I'm interested in getting into this world of finance, well, I'm, I am a fan of again being gritty and 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 hustling. Do research. Figure out the companies that are out there. LinkedIn is an amazing tool. Find where other people have worked. Reach, say, hey, Marcus, I'm connecting with you now. I now know you. Do you know any other firms that do these things? Start playing that game, having those calls, put yourself out there, figure out how do I make myself more attractive and give myself more, more um, at bats, if you will. Because we're gonna, in, in life, you're gonna hear no way more than you hear yes. That's true with jobs, it's true with investing, it's true with everything. So just be okay with that and recognize that eventually you'll end up where you need to be. Um, and, then, and then lastly, on the retention front, this is, a, this is where I think it's tough. And this is where I have issues with some of these diversity initiatives that are at companies now. They get you in the door, but then they don't surround you or make you feel like you're at home. And and at the end of the day, like and it's it can be little things. You're in a you're 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 in a conversation, and everybody's talking about a movie. That guess what? It it, it wasn't a movie that was popular in my in my circle, in my culture when I was growing up. So now I'm excluded from that conversation and they're not purposely trying to exclude me. It's just, it was their experience. And, and so I think it's on organizations to figure out how do we make people feel more comfortable in our place and how do we continue to be candid with them? How do we give them the right feedback to help them develop? Uh, other things that you see, and I know we're running up against time, is Minorities and other kind of diverse candidates, when it comes to performance reviews, a lot of times they'll get generic feedback that will make them think they're doing a good job or a decent job. And then when it comes time for the promotion, they don't get the promotion. So there's a disconnect. And part of that, I think, is driven by the fact that people are uncomfortable giving that feedback to them because they don't want to step on toes or you know they don't feel like they're connected in the same way. So like you got to encourage your, your companies to say, look, give it to me real. I want to be the best I can be. So tell me if I'm not doing something right, tell me now. Like, don't make me think I'm doing a good job because then ultimately all I'm going to do is I'm going to be unhappy and I'm going to leave. And then they got to try and find a replacement again to fill that. So it is it is really, really hard. It's really complex, uh, but it, it just, it takes everybody willing to put an effort in, I, I think, uh, uh, on both sides. Thank you. I think that was a good response. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you to everyone. I'm sure that was a very insightful in event. And just in closing, I would say that using, and that is in your own words, using private equity to do good is very noble and to ensure that there is more representation is also a noble cause. And I'm sure that the future is challenging, but it looks bright. So. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending this event. And with that, back to you, Michael. Great. Um, Dominique, thank you for moderating. It's one of the, the real joys of doing these sessions is seeing our awesome students flex their moderation muscle. So uh, a new skill for you, Dominique. You did a great job. Marcus, thanks for joining today. Lots of great uh, questions, great insights from you. And we look forward as we move into 2021 and, and trying to do things more on campus. We, I mean, it's so great to have you in Cleveland and look forward to getting you here in person um, with our students and our community. But today was, was great. It was really a great conversation. Thank you for taking the time.